Yeah. Oh. You're gonna help me light candles in a minute. Kara, all that's fine.
we're glad you're here this morning. I'm not sure why my other mic won't work, but that's fine. Uh, glad you're here this morning. Just a couple things to get started this morning. If you're tuned in online, first of all, glad you're there as well. Hope you'll jump in and worship with us today. Several things in your worship folder this morning about uh, Christmas, Christmas programs for different groups in our church. Uh, I hope you'll jump right in and find out where you can uh, be part of any of those kind of things. There's also throughout the month of December, you have an insert uh, for this coming week uh, about our Lottie Moon uh, week of prayer for international missions. Lottie Moon is a uh, time we celebrate at Christmas time for all of our international missionaries across the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. So there's a week of prayer for several of those missionaries there. And then the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes towards those missionaries. 100% of whatever you give towards that uh, goes directly to international missions. Uh, you can do that throughout the month. Several other things going on there, and, and again, I hope you'll jump in and find where you can be involved. Uh, two weeks from today uh, is our Christmas program for our children. They're going to be leading us that morning on the 17th of December, so you'll definitely want to be here for that. Uh, check that out. They're, they're, they're working hard for that. Uh, I believe they're doing a little bit of rehearsal today, and then there's a big dress rehearsal next Sunday, uh, and then we'll be, we'll be ready to go for it on the 17th. Uh, one more thing going on during the month of December. Uh, they're working on doing an electronic directory. Uh, so anytime during the month of December, if you'll catch Miss Don Welsh out there in the North Act, she's going to be taking pictures uh, and doing an electronic directory of all of our uh, membership uh, throughout the month of December. So any Sunday in December, just catch her out there. She's going to snap your picture off uh, if you want to get all pretty up. It's not that you're not pretty up already, but I'm just saying to prepare yourself if you need to uh, for that anytime during the month of December. I'm standing on this side of the stage because my family is also leading our Advent reading this morning. So if I had to come on up. shall cover the earth and deep darkness is the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. This morning, we come to light the second of the Advent candles. The light of the flame symbolizes the light of God's love that lives inside of every believer. 1 John 1, 5 tells us that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. As we light the second Advent candle, the challenge for us as believers is to let the light of Jesus Christ shine so that those who live in darkness may find hope in him.
Ничего. Ничего не меняется. So holy glory. As the Lord God is on his toga.
being seated and invite you to find your copy of God's Word and join me in James chapter 2. We work our way through James 1 and today we come to the conclusion <coughs> of chapter 2 of James and we're dealing with my faith. And every every sermon has been entitled My uh, My Temptation, My Trials, my it's all about how I'm going to live the Christian life. And so today we come to my faith. I, I read a few quotes uh, about faith. The first, uh, my faith ought to get me in trouble at times. If everybody thinks I am nuts, I may be. Uh, it's, it's okay if some think I'm nuts, but I'm probably in trouble if no one thinks I'm nuts because my faith should take me across the lines that no one else can get me. Faith is resting in the fact that God has an objective in leaving me on the scene when I feel useless to him at times and a burden to others. You ever, ever been in that place? Uh, I like this one. Tradition is the living faith of those now dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those still living. That's kind of a challenge in and of itself. But the key is faith is so much more than just believing for the sake of claiming that you have faith. Faith is more about what you believe in than what you believe about it. So much more. Now, it's a personal thing, very personal thing. That's why the title says that, my faith, because it's mine. I possess it. I I own the faith because the faith owns me. That's what my faith is in. So let's look uh, at James's words here, beginning in verse 14, where he describes my faith. What does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? That's twice he's asked that question. What does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Now, if you read through that quickly, you probably feel like you're sitting in a chair watching a cat chase its tail in the middle of the floor because it's just back and forth. The word faith is used 11 times in these 12 to 13 verses, and the word works is used 12 times, and it's just back and forth about faith and works. But what I want you to see is he says that my faith, what, what it is to be my faith without my works. James says, what does it profit my brothers or my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? James' summarizing question is not just can, uh, can faith save him, but more accurately, can faith alone save him? Can faith alone save him? I grew up in an area uh, of Alabama where there were a whole lot of folks that liked to talk about being saved by works. It was a prominent discussion. And you get in this discussion and it became more of an argument. And it's just, it was kind of the thing where if somebody mentions that, you just kind of 
quietly slide away and try to avoid the situation. But the key was uh, a works-based salvation is where a person is trying religiously to work their way to heaven by earning their salvation through their works. That's the opposite end of the stick of what James is describing here. That's why Paul, when he wrote to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he said, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, or else you would boast. Now, in fact, the only thing that Paul said you can earn that's earnable is our wages. And to earn our wages, he, he was talking about it in Romans 6.23 when he said that the wages of sin is death. What we earn, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In our text today, he called, or in, in Ephesians 2.89, Paul referred to it as the gift of God. It is a gift of God. And then in Romans 6.23, he called it the gift of God, not of works. So it's not something we earn. Works cannot save you. Likewise, faith alone cannot save you. Paul stated that we are saved by grace through faith. So if works does not save me and faith alone doesn't save me, how do I act on my faith? See if this illustration helps any. Uh, my faith is where I believe that a plane can fly me from Lexington Airport to Miami over the Christmas holidays for $103. I checked it out. Now, don't ask me. It, it's irrelevant. I was just checking it out so that I could tell you that. $103. Now, getting home is your own. <laughs> Good luck on that. But $103 would get you there. To, to say that I believe that plane would fly me there is one thing. That's, that's stating my faith. Now, I could go to Lexington Airport on December 17th, and I could stand in the on-ramp, and I could tell myself over and over, I believe I can fly. Y'all heard the song. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I could stand there. I could sing those words. I could say those words over and over, but my faith does nothing until... I take a step of faith, get on the ramp, and board the plane. That's my works. It's a combination of faith and works. My faith does nothing until I act on that faith. Look at James's illustration here. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have some kind of action, if it does not have works, is dead. Now think through this. If salvation is life to you and me, then without my works, there is no life. And I am dead that means that it has to work together. This is where James says that someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. By my works. So James says that you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So my question to you today is, do you believe? Do you believe? Before we dig any deeper in faith by works, let's answer that question. Do you believe? James swings the pendulum 100% in the opposite direction, saying that even the demons believe and tremble. The key is this. In the introduction, I said faith is more about what you believe in than what you believe about it. What you believe in. And I said that because James says you believe that there is one God. That simple fact is believing that God exists. It doesn't say what you believe about him, but it's simply saying that you believe he exists. And even the demons believe that he exists. They tremble because they know he's more powerful than all of them put together. 
So they tremble. To simply say that you believe. You talk to people on the street, most of them will tell you, I believe in God. But what do they believe in God? Have they put their faith in Him? Have they acted on that faith? Now, here's the key. This is where my faith by my works comes into play. I read this the other day and just kind of uh, Christopher Columbus wrote to King Ferdinand and Qu Queen Isabella in 1502 saying that neither reason nor mathematics nor maps were any use to me. Fully accomplished were the words of Isaiah. I don't think I'd ever read that before. He was referring to the prophecy recorded in Isaiah 11, 10 through 12. That the Lord would recover the remnant of his people and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. What that meant was Columbus believed there was a passageway. He believed that God had ordained a way to bring his people back. And if there was no way, then he was going to prove there was no way. But he, he did four maritime voyages from 1492 through 1504. Four maritime voyages. And on those voyages, he discovered a westward path, passageway to Asia. And he did that based on his faith. His faith took works. He had to get on board a ship, actually four different ships, and sail so that he could prove what he believed in. The word of God. Isaiah. I like that. So the question is not so much if you believe, but do you believe enough to take action on what you say you believe? Look at James' words in verses 20 through 22. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? So, how is faith? made perfect. How is faith made perfect? According to James it was by works. That's how his faith was made perfect. Barnes note says that the two words made perfect actually mean to be completed or finished. In other words it's kind of like an unfinished puzzle. Anybody ever started out on a thousand piece puzzle and you got to the end there were no pieces left in the box but there were holes all through the puzzle. Isn't that frustrating? That's an incomplete puzzle. Likewise, our faith is not completed until we act on it. Until we put it in motion. Until we take some kind of steps. Barnes further says that it was so carried out as to show its legitimate and fair results. This does not mean that the faith itself was defective before this, and that the defect was remedied by good works. Didn't remedy any defects. Or that there is any deficiency in what the right kind of faith can do in the matter of justification, which is to be helped out by good works. But that there was that kind of completion, which is the thing that came to pass when you added the works. He completed. It made it perfect. I like that. In fact, the two complete each other, meaning that my faith working together with my works. My faith, birth, there's a new word. My faith working together with my works. It's been said that separating faith and works is like separating heat from light, from a candle. You know that both are produced by the candle. You know that they are not the same thing, heat and light. But you also know you cannot separate them because of the togetherness of their existence. You 
can't separate eat and life, likewise. You cannot separate faith and works. The scripture was fulfilled, which said that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Remember that Abraham, uh, Abraham had righteousness credited to his account long before Jesus ever came and paid the price. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Abraham was called righteous long before Christ paid that debt. you got to love James's added words here that Abraham was the friend of God. I like that. This was in virtue of his strong faith and his obedience or his actions. That reference comes from Isaiah 41, 8, where God said, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. God said that about Abraham. I like that. Adam Clark's commentary adds that this is the highest character ever given to any man that God called him his friend. Nobody else. The thing about friendship is you depend on one another. And you know that if there's ever a point that you are falling through the cracks, ever a point that you are about to fall on your face, your friend will be there for you. Now here's the key. God's never going to fall through the cracks. So us being his friend simply means the best we can do is what he asks us to do. That's to put our faith in motion. To take action on what he's called us to believe in. James sums it up by saying that you see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith. And he says that, likewise, Rahab was justified by works. Now, I don't want to skip over what James says. He, he stipulates that Rahab was a harlot. That means that everybody in her day knew that she was, in, she was troubled for that town. They knew that. Biblically, she was a lady of the night, meaning her daily occupation was sinful behavior, to put it lightly. At the same time, remember that Matthew included Rahab in the lineage of Jesus. I don't know if you remember that or not. Go back and read that long line of lineage. And you'll come to a point where Matthew says, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Her name is mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. Regardless of what, you know what that says to me? It doesn't matter how. Badly, you've blown it. Anybody ever blown it pretty royally? Anybody? I know. I know you. That means that God can use you just like He did her. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how ashamed of your past you are, God can still use you because He did raise you. So what were Rahab's works that justified her? James says that she received the messengers and sent them out another way because she knew that they were going to be killed. If she didn't take steps of action on what she believed. Barnes note says that her act showed that she truly believed God. If that act had not been performed, the fact would have been Show, in fact, would have shown that her faith was not genuine. And she could not have been justified. God saw her faith as it was. He saw that it would produce acts of obedience. And he accepted her as righteous. Regardless of her past, he accepted her as righteous. The act which she did, uh, which she performed was the public manifestation of her faith, the evidence that she was justified in him. <coughs> Listen again to James's closing summary. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith 
without works is dead also. It's been said that only man comprehends what he cannot see and believes what he cannot comprehend. Much of what you and I comprehend, we cannot see. Atoms, germs, love, loyalty, sacrifice. We can't see those things. We can see evidences of them. How? By works. Somebody says they love you. They usually show it, don't they? There's some kind of action involved. They don't just say the words. Same thing has to be true about our faith and our works. He who lives by sight alone lives poorly indeed. Faith is learning to live by insight rather than by sight alone. So back to that question, what do you believe? Paul wrote to the Philippian believers and said, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is at work in you. God is at work in me. God is at work in this place. Look around. God is at work in this place. And he wants to raise our faith so that we can act on that faith and see what he does. I'm asking about it. Lee, I didn't talk to you, but I'm going to ask if you'll come stand down front because we're going to play a song that I'll, I'll need to play on. But in just a moment, Lee's going to be standing down front. I'm going to ask some deacons to stand in the back and be available uh, for you to step to and ask to pray for you. Because God is moving in your heart. As he is challenging your faith, will you take a step of faith and simply come and say, pray for me? I won't. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you've loved us with an everlasting love. God, I ask that as we follow through with what you are challenging us to be and to do, I pray that you will show us just how great a God you are. I ask you, Lord, to prove your faith. Stand to our feet as we sing. God is dealing with your heart. Will you come?
moment. I will call us into business at this time. Today is the day we're supposed to vote on deacons, and we have four deacons rotating.